Hello, my name is Mario. Welcome to another video. In today's episode, I will share with you another tip for building microservices in Go. Specifically, I will be discussing with you how to implement and use Apache Kafka. So what is Apache Kafka? Kafka is an event streaming platform. And let's focus on events right now. Event means that it is something that happened. And when we're talking about Kafka, there are three important things to, to, to indicate. There will be a uh, key, which in our case, in the context that we're using right now, will be in our Tudo microservice that happens to be using tasks, will be a UUID. There is a value that indicates, hey, something happened. For example, a task was created with a description and with a priority, and it's going to supposed to, and the due date is XYZ. And there is a time, a timestamp rather. All of this is important because this is how it's going to be. We are going to be using all these values, and these values are going to be used for ordering that data that is going to be coming into Kafka. So, what is Kafka used for? So, it's used for publishing and subscribing to events, storing events, and processing events. And it does all of these thanks to the event, event streaming platform that is happening behind, behind the scenes with Kafka. Kafka is not only for sending data, but it's also a way to, like I said, produce, um, write a pro process, a store, and publish, and subscribe. And there are different APIs for doing that. In this video, we're going to be focusing on only publishing and subscribing. In future videos, I will be covering Kafka in much more detail. So how does it work? Well, there is this concept called topic that you can define multiple partitions. When there is a producer and it sends uh, an event to the topic, the way it, the topic is configured, it will send and organize those events depending on the partitions. They will still keep their order. And what happened is that when the consumers come into place and they are grouped by a thing called group ID, and, and if you think about it, it will be some, some sort of a way to indicate, hey, you, uh, a group ID, will have a different way to read the data. And those consumers IDs, or rather those group IDs, will be obviously con part of a multiple instances that are working together to consume those events. So a consumer ID, uh, or rather a consumer doesn't mean one instance, but rather a combination of N instance, instances or multiple instances. And the way they read will always be in the order that they were configured. And this is important to notice because depending on, on how the consumers are configured, they can read uh, things in a different way, rather the instances that are part of that group will be reading the events in a different way. However, all of them will always keep the order. So although, for example, the consumer one with the group ID ABC already finished reading this, those three events, if there is a new consumer called consumer two with the group ID XYZ, it will come in and still read those events that are still available in the stream in Kafka. So this is the important thing about Kafka or the cool thing about Kafka is that when you're sending data to, to Kafka, everything is stored and there is uh, obviously a duration right there when the events will expire, but you can still add new consumers and those can still consume those events that were coming or were already produced, I don't know, a few days ago, a few hours ago, and whatnot. So that's enough. That's enough. Let's go and let's discuss the code that, and let's see how this works in real life. As usual, the link to the code will be in the description. There's a repository that you can click, that you can clone on GitHub, and you can f feel free uh, to check it out. So I have these two applications already running. One will be the Elasticsearch indexer, and the idea what we're going to be doing is uh, is something like this. So we are going to be creating a task that happens to be let's say new task. And as usual, this, most of these things are we reusing the things that we already built previously in, in previous videos. So feel free to check those out. So when I create a task, what is going to happen, I want you to pay attention to this window. It will be receiving an updated uh, event or rather a created event that indicates, hey, an event was created, an event was submitted to Kafka, and then the consumer will have to do something about it. In the context of this implementation, I'm doing something similar to what I did in the previous video with RabbitMQ and I'm just receiving the event, and I'm literally indexing that event. So because I'm doing an indexing in Elasticsearch, what I want to be doing to demonstrate uh, what I what just happened is I want to just search what was just included, or what was just created. And this one is actually returning a, a bunch of different values. But if, we, if you scroll down to what was posted right here, 
you will notice that this is the one that we was created just now which is 7f and then some sort some sort of a uuid if i look at the results you will notice that there is a 7f and so on and so forth and it, the same happens with all the other events i will show you how this works in the, in the code uh so if i do a task and i say a change again and then i will i will do the two day 12 and it's done is true again i will be receiving oh what happened oh there's a mistake right here if i do again an update it will execute a invalid request which goes oh obviously this is incorrect if i do an execute it will be okay and you've noticed that there is an updated event right here again if i go back to to the elastic search endpoint that we implemented previously you will notice that if i search by change you will see the one that i use change so how does this look in real life if we look at the implementation there is a new repository that does what i was just describing which is hey we're going to be doing the sending the, or publishing the events to kafka by after receiving those events in the service so if you remember all of this is sort of similar to what we did before with rabbitmq but rather now instead of calling rabbitmq we're calling kafka and the biggest difference i will show you what what's the biggest difference between the two implementations is that um in kafka what i'm trying to do here is that instead of using gob or encoding gob like we've used before i'm actually using json and this is a way to sort of like defining a, a um, an encoding a format between the, your different services that you're using so there are a bunch of services there are a bunch of different ways to encode obviously uh, messages there is avro there is protocol buffer json binary on you literally you can come up with your own so wh I'm, what i'm doing here is i'm actually using json because i want to show a different way to do this i in, in in future videos i will i will show you how i like doing this for versioning purposes but for now uh, we're using json okay so when defining a new event type which happens to be right here oops what the heck is going on oh, there you go so this event is literally a struct that happens to be including a type and a value and i'm coding that value and i'm just literally just sending that to kafka the consumer is, is slightly similar to what we did before with a um, elastic search in rabbit or right rabbit mq is receiving again this one is again one of those things that is using graceful shutdown and all of that fun stuff so please again check out the code and and play with it if we look at the actual code you will notice that there is again sort of like an infinite loop that is receiving an event and then pulling the values from the kafka consumer and what is this doing is is waiting for uh 150 milliseconds to pull the values from the a consumer of rather from kafka and then from there depending if the value is, is is valid according to our rules it does what it's supposed to be doing which will be indexing or deleting the records again it goes back to the same process that we defined previously in when we use rabbit mq now like i was telling you what is the biggest difference between just in for example if you are i've been talking about rabbit mq or kafka is that if we look at the way we have right here and again, we already processed three events, right? According to this. The cool thing is that because we can define or replay the events after they were pushed to, the cons to, to Kafka, we can add new clients that they can replay those events or reconsume those events after those happens while that data is still in storage. And that is the biggest difference between RabbitMQ and Kafka, for example. So if I do a consumer using the default uh, you know if you go to the quick start in apache kafka there is this fancy way to download a few different tools that are basically useful for interacting with the kafka uh, service so if i do that and i execute the consumer you will notice that i'm going to be receiving all the events that were produced previously although i'm literally a different client so it was creating a, a kafka rules hello world new task and i change it okay if you notice i have the updated right here created i created and one that i created before so how cool is this right because it, it depending on what problem you're trying to solve perhaps using kafka makes more sense or maybe perhaps it makes sense to use uh, MQ, or perhaps it makes sense to not use any of these because it's overly complicated again it's one of those things that you need to consider when building microservices and whatnot so let's jump into the conclu conclusions and and let's discuss 
what should we do next? So when should we use Kafka in the first place? So if you're planning to build something that is highly distributed, that happens to be communicating with different microservices, or rather you're building a system consi that consists of multiple microservices that happen to be communicating with each other via messages asynchronously, and those happen to have the need to replay messages from time to time, perhaps it makes sense to use Kafka. One thing I can tell you right now is that Kafka is a highly difficult thing to manage and maintaining it manually, it's a really difficult thing to do. So if you're planning to use Kafka, I highly encourage you to use something that is managed. For example, Amazon has the manage uh, Kafka service, if I recall correctly, MSK, and that one will literally, Amazon will handle all of that. If you're planning to maintain that on your own, you're going to have not problems, but it's going to be a little bit difficult than you expected. Other than that, uh, the the support in Go is is nice. Confluent, which is the company behind uh, commercially uh, maintaining and, and supporting Kafka, they already have a package. There are a few other alternatives. I personally like using the, the commercially supported packages because obviously the company is supporting those packages and therefore they, they want to keep your customers happy and uh, their customers happy. So those will be my recommendation. It's supported by Go. It, it Again, it's one of those things because it's using C Go. Perhaps the performance is not as good as it would be if you were using C or C++. But again, it's not that bad. And the last thing to con con consider is that it's a, a, a sort of like a big learning curve. but a, and, and, and it's... It could be problematic when trying to version different things because again a few different things that work in different languages are not supported in go for example the um, registry uh, for events uh, that happens to be using avro at the moment is not supported in go so those are a few different things to consider when trying to use kafka in go in the first place so should you use kafka i guess it depends on your on your problem and the thing that you're trying to solve but in the end you know think about it and if you have any questions just let me know i will talk to you next time okay take care and be safe see you